I'll just give you a brief rundown of the next uh, four or five meetings. Uh, November 29th, Rich Holderman will discuss the history of the Covenanters and the Underground Railroad here in town. Uh, he's a pastor of the Reformed Presbyterian Church, and it's something he's been working on for a long time, but it should be pretty good. December 27th, Chris Williams, who's a two-time city golf champ here in town, will discuss the history of uh, Cascades Golf Course, which is something he's very familiar with. It's got a rich history. January 31st, uh, Duncan Campbell will give a program on the local limestone quarries and stone mills. I've seen this one uh, a few months ago, and it's really good. February 28th, Christine Friesel of the Monroe County Public Library is going to uh, talk about her uh, Monroe County Timeline program that she's been working on for a long time, which deals with the history of the county, and uh, we need a lot of input from people to make this work right. She's going to talk about that. And then in March, Bradley Cook will make uh, another uh, return performance. He's from the IU Photo Archives Department. He'll show many more of the uh, thousands of images he's got in his collection. Last time it went really well, and I think people will like it. And then uh, George is louder than me, so he's going to finish this out. <laughs> Good afternoon. Maybe uh, you don't know me, I'm George Carpenter. Uh, I'm the guy who labels himself on the emails as your always faithful and humble servant. Uh, I'd like to welcome you this afternoon. We have uh, a friend of mine that I met well, five or six years ago, a fellow rail historian, only you've got a PhD in it, and I don't have a PhD in that. But uh, Jake, John Jake Butler, is uh, familiar to the local community as one of the principals of Butler Winery. Uh, today he's going to speak to us on the topic of railroad depots in Bloomington, Indiana. And to give you a little background on this, there probably wouldn't be a Bloomington if there hadn't been a moon on railroad. Because it would be someplace like Harrisburg, someplace like that. Because the railroad made it possible for Bloomington to be able to work in the timber industry and the limestone industry and bring students to school here and all like that. It wouldn't have existed otherwise. Uh, I met Jake about five years ago uh, through the Mona Historical Society. We were at our headquarters at Landon at that time. And Jake comes in and says, I'd like to learn something about Mona on history. I said, oddly enough, we'd like to teach you. So uh, he came in and became a member of the Mona Railroad Society. And uh, we've been friends ever since then. So it was my pleasure to bring him as our speaker. Uh, he's going to start off with um, the, the New Albany and Salem Depot. It started here in 19, 1854. Uh, have I covered everything? You've covered it. You've got <coughs> two other things. Number one, the Legion. Thank you very much for what you do for us. Yes, please. As, as within your power, be generous to our servers. Leave them what tips as you can. Number two, cats. You guys are the greatest things to slice bread. Thank you very much for doing that. I, I expect to, uh, to release to you in the next week or so at least one, maybe two of our presentations that have been done recently. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to that page. You won't be getting as many emails from me. That way you'll know what comes new on the on the, uh, the uh, YouTube site. Mike, anything? Uh, I just want everybody to know we'll get this fixed before next time. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. This is this has been a triple witching day as it comes to just about everything going in the sink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. Any comments, questions, criticisms from the group? Thank you very much. Looking forward to this presentation. Jake? Thank you. I uh, oh uh Thanks to George for taking the time to get me to come here. He contacted me multiple times. He's very dogged. Um, and he was, he was kind enough to invite me, and I appreciate being able to come. I also appreciate all of you coming out uh, on this fine afternoon to hear this talk. 
Now, as George said, I have a PhD in U.S. history that I got right here in Bloomington from IU. I got it in 2012, and I specialized in landscape and transportation history. I wrote my dissertation on the history of railroad depots in Bloomington, Indiana, and Roanoke, Virginia. And currently, I'm working in our family business, the Butler Winery. Now, this story begins for me, and therefore for all the rest of you, on 12th Street. Uh, I grew up in this little house almost completely obscured by the trees, but what dominated my backyard was the fill of the Illinois Central, and there the remains of the Illinois Central Depot. And so as a little kid looking out over my backyard, it's all overgrown now, but back then it was cut clean. Looking out, I could see these trains go by. And I could see this old building, and I thought, well, that's pretty neat. There must be some history here. So that's where the story began for me. Now, trains didn't come by very often. I was born in 1975, so by the time I'm interested in the railroad, it's probably 1985, give or take a year or two. Um, and trains were pretty few and far between. This is a nice shot of the Illinois Central train coming out of the tunnel by Unionville. Um, here's another shot. Apparently the snow brought out the photographers. This is a <laughs> Illinois Central train probably being used to clear snow. Look at the front of it there. Um, it, and it's a tiny little train uh, on the Shuffle Creek trestle. Here's that same train uh, further crossing Mount Gilead Road by the church. And here it is, it's finally made it to the depot that was by my house. And the lights are on in the depot, they're still using this building um, even in, into the 80s, but it's no longer being used for any sort of passenger work. And Trains didn't come by a lot during the day. And when they did come by, it was at night. And it was hard to convince my mother that, for me to stay up late so that I could watch the train come by. So that just didn't happen. Um, here's an example of our same snowy train, 8152. Uh, it's now taken the siding, and it's waiting for the regular train that's coming through. And this regular train always pulled coal. That's all that I ever saw on that railroad, with lots of coal cars. And the locomotives looked a lot like that. It was pretty grimy, industrial, sort of run down at that point, uh, branch line of the Illinois Central. So that was the railroad I grew up by. But it seemed like there must have been something there before, a story, a history. Now there's an another railroad in town, and that railroad was the Monon, but I never saw Monon trains run by. It had been gone for years. Matter of fact, this is a right in the transitionary period we have a Monon engine waiting to be repainted and here we have one coming out as the LNN and that's the LNN absorbed the Monon um, and so by the time I was a kid on the other railroad in town you might see LNN engines but they didn't look like that that's freshly shopped brand new paint job instead they looked more like this um, but at least they came by during the day and at least they pulled something besides coal so it was a little more interesting. But the LNN was going through a transition at that time period. And actually, it itself was going to be absorbed in a series of mergers. And so I got to see other things come through town. Uh, here we have the LNN. Sometimes I get to see the Seaboard Coastline LNN paint job from the family line system. Not too often. Occasionally, some beat up Seaboard system came through. But my favorite. My favorite was the Chessie system locomotives. I mean, look at that paint job. That is a classy looking locomotive. So as a kid, I fell in love with the Chessie system. And I wanted to know more about it. So for Christmas, I asked my dad to get me a book about the Chessie system. Here's a, what they look like in real life. And he got me this book. And it's really a history of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. And it didn't have a whole lot about Chessie system in it at all. So that was a little disappointing. Although there's the logo that gets used again in their corporate logo, the sleeping kitten. Sleep like a kitten in the air-conditioned cars of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway. 
So that was cool. I was now hooked on railroad history, and so I asked my dad to get me another railroad history book, and he got me this one. That's a pretty good book. And it had stuff about the Monon, and it had stuff a little bit about Bloomington. But the stuff about Bloomington was a long time ago, and I had trouble relating to it. There was lots of black and white photographs, steam locomotives, Monon route. It was interesting, but as, you know, a 10-year-old, I wanted something a little more. I wanted to be able to identify with it. But there's this one picture in the book that I could identify with because it was taken in Bloomington. But it was some far off Bloomington, some distant place that I didn't really recognize anything in the photograph. Until one day when I was sitting down at the first National Bank drive through which would be about here, and I looked out the window and I realized that that grain elevator was still there. I was sitting in the spot where the depot must have been because they're the eaves of the depot. What had happened? Why did Bloomington tear down their depot? As you know, a 10 or 12 year old, that was something that was hard to wrap my mind around. Well, later on, um, Here's that grain elevator sometime in the eh, probably 80s, maybe 70s. Uh, and here's the Bank One now. It had been First National Bank, uh, site of where the drive through used to be, although it's not even there at this point. My grain elevator is missing. This is, I took this picture in college. They'd taken out the grain elevator. But I was going to do a paper on the Monon Railroad. And it, so I went down there and I was going to do a then and now paper. So I was going to take a new photograph where that old one had been. And I noticed something else. That telephone pole. That telephone pole was leaning in 1947. <laughs> and it was still leaning in 1997. <laughs> But everything else was gone. That seems odd. So I thought the next time I get a chance, I'm going to look more into this history. And I really didn't get a chance. I was always writing papers for other people about other subjects. And then eventually came time to write my dissertation. I thought, you know what? I'm going to write about that Bloomington Depot. And I might do a little short history of all the depots that were in Bloomington. And to me at the time, that meant that one that I grew up by. It meant that one that's still down on uh, Morton. Whoops, skipping ahead. And it meant the one that was gone in the photograph, the one that should have been by that leaning telephone pole. It turned out to be a lot more complicated than that. Originally, I imagine my dissertation might talk about, oh, five, six, seven different places and all the depots in those places. By the time I got done with Bloomington, there were eight depots. And I had a lot more information than I ever thought I would. So I wound up cutting all the other places down except for Roanoke. So this is what was going to be a real short history of three buildings that turned out to be much more complicated. So depot number one it was built by the New Albany in Salem. It was a brick combination depot, meaning that it had both passenger and freight functions in one building. It was built in 1854. It lasted until 1868. It was located between 4th and 5th on Railroad Street, approximately in the same position as the later Monon depots. Now, in 1850, <clears throat> this map shows railroads in their infancy. I'm sorry, it's kind of small, but there's not a lot to show on this one. 1830, hardly any railroads at all. 1840, we've got some sprouting up, including the early uh, Vincennes in Indianapolis. By 1850, that's the New Albany in Salem right there. So when it starts out, it's one of the first railroads that's being built in the country. Um, and it's founded in 1847. Construction begins in 1848. Uh, and the railway was originally designed to go from its two namesake cities. It was going to go from the river, the Ohio River at New Albany, up to Salem. Now, pretty quickly, their ambition expanded, and the rail, 
the rail uh, railroad was uh, imagined larger. And so instead of stopping in Salem, eventually they're going to stop it all the way at Lake Michigan and at Michigan City. Um, so it surveyed through Monroe County in the fall of 1849. Tracks reach uh, Monroe County by the summer of 1853. Takes a while to construct a railroad. And it officially reaches Bloomington October 11th, 1854. So now by 1860, we see the railroad net is much larger, and here is the railroad that started out as the New Albany and Salem, and it stretches all the way from the Ohio River to Lake Michigan. And here we have New Albany, and there we have Salem, and there's the first little stretch. Now this is a Sanborn map showing downtown Bloomington. Uh, I don't have one early enough to show the first depot, but this does show the site of the first and second depot. They're in the same spot. So here's the public square to get you oriented. There's College, Walnut, here's 5th Street, here's 4th Street. Right here was the site of the first depot. Um, now I wondered, why was the depot where it was? I mean, really, you could build the depot at any spot as long as it was as it was touching the railroad, right? Had to be touching the railroad. But besides that, the depot was sort of up in the air. Now they chose this spot because it's downtown and it's close to the courthouse. But there is another reason. Here's aerial view today. Courthouse. This is where the depot was. They've gone and built a hotel on it. I was really disappointed. I just had this fantasy that somehow we'd go back and we'd rebuild that depot and everything would be great again. But it's getting further and further from possibility. But the reason that they picked that particular spot of all the city lots in Bloomington that were by the downtown, it could have been on the other side of the tracks, could have been a little up the tracks, was because of the Orchard Brothers. Now the Orchard Brothers were uh, local businessmen and they operated the Bloomington's first stagecoach line. And the line went from Louisville to Indianapolis. And to get those days, that was a two-day trip. So they needed some place to overnight. So Bloomington was the spot where they overnighted, and so they built a hotel for their stagecoach guests. So the uh, stagecoach, the hotel, is quite a business enterprise. Well, by 1854, the stagecoach isn't making quite as much money. The hotel's actually making more money for them. And they, being clever guys, they realize that if the railroad depot was right by, just right by their hotel, they'd get a lot of business. So they actually trade city lots and then donate the city lots to the New Albany and Salem to get them to build the railroad depot directly across the street from their hotel. And this is the livery barn that served as the stables for, at the uh, orchards. Okay, so the other interesting thing to note about this, now once again, this is not the original depot because I don't have a Sanborn map of it, but this run-through arrangement, see the track coming right into the depot? That was on the first depot and that was on the second depot. And it's an unusual arrangement, and I'll talk about that more later. Now here's what it looked like. We don't know. We have no <laughs> photographs. We have no diagrams. We have no woodcuts. All these things that I've imagined. We don't have them. Uh, there's, there's reasons for this. The railroad records were destroyed by fire in 1868. The ones that survived that were destroyed again in 1907. Um, and then the Monon Railroad Historical Technical Society came into possession of the remaining uh, Monon records, but the Bloomington drawer, the repository of all the Bloomington information, disappeared. And so we don't have that either. So as a result, this is what we have to look at. Um, somebody might have it squirreled away, and if you do, come clean. I'm still looking for it. Why are you looking at me? Now, what do we know about it? Here's some things that we do know about it. We know that it was a, where is it, right here? First class brick passenger and freight house. It cost $6,500 to build, about the same amount as Bedford 
Um, also Crawfordsville uh, and Greencastle and Gosport. Those are all right around the same amount to build. They're all listed as the same sort of station. We suspect that they were all very similar buildings. Um, this is what the Gosport Depot looked like. And since we suspect that the Bloomington Depot was very similar, I'm going to use this as a stand-in while I talk about the Bloomington Depot. Uh, Carter Pering gave a local history talk in 1907, and he described the old depot as a great, big, unsightly brick depot given as a compliment to the town and the people who had given their lots and lands and chattels and good money so spontaneously. So that's one description. Big, unsightly brick depot. Okay, I could see that. Uh, the 1868 Bloomington Progress described it as a fine brick depot. This slide's probably from the 1860s. Notice we've got the balloon stack locomotive. We have the old time passenger coach. Um, square water tank, which was unique to Gosport. So, we don't know a whole lot about that first depot, but one of the things that we do know is how the depot area and the depot was used. And I'm going to use this term dooryard to talk about it. Now, it's an old-fashioned term, but yeah, talking about history here. Uh, and it referred to the area outside your door, your dooryard. Today, we still use side yard, backyard, maybe front yard. We don't use dooryard. Uh, at the time, they also had barnyards. And these were fenced areas. This is an old term. This is uh, the cottage dooryard, a painting by 1673 um, by a Dutch artist. But the phrase is probably most famously used in the uh, Whitman poem, The Elegy to Lincoln, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. Now you're like, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, if this is your house, and this is the public street, the dooryard is the space in between. And it's fenced off necessarily because if you wanted to have this nice green garden growing in your dooryard in an era where livestock were much freer than they are today, going up and down the city streets, you had to keep them fenced out. Or you might want to keep your family, kids, ducks fenced in, and so they would stay in the dooryard. Now, the dooryard is private space, but it's public space too. It's kind of in between. It's an extension of your house, but it also meets up with the street. The depots work in the same way. They're an extension of everywhere else, but they're also nestled in the heart of Bloomington. Um, and then this right here, this is also a lot like the depot, the gate, because it's at the dooryard gate where you'd go to greet people and you'd go to say farewell. And the depot serves that same function in Bloomington. It's that spot where you go to greet somebody. You don't follow them onto the train to the next town. You stop at the depot, you say your goodbyes, just like you would stop at the gate. And there's a lot of goodbyes that get said at the gate. Now, I'm a little annoyed at this lady. She's just outside the gate. She should have stopped at the gate. Um, but it's a special moment. She's seen her husband off to war. This is the Civil War. This, these are uh, courier prints. Here he is returning. Once again, she's stepped just beyond the gate. Uh, but here she is greeting him. Well, the depot works in the same way. Uh, this is an Illinois Central ad uh, from I don't know when. But it shows the locals coming down to the depot to meet the train, right? It's a big event. Just like you might sit on your porch and watch people go by in the street or talk to people over the front gate, you could go down to the depot and visit. Um, so the depot opens onto an area of Bloomington that serves travelers. And that area right around the depot is going to have all your hotels, all your livery services, your taxis, um, that sort of thing. So here's locals greeting the train down at Steinsville. I 
love this slide. Uh, this is a, such a great shot of the locomotive coming in, the brake is going. Uh, it's in 1900. Now, uh, here's what Carter Pering had to say about the Bloomington Depot and people going down to the depot. From their first inception, almost the entire population of town turned out in mass to meet the trains. The novelty and attraction were irresistible. The people got the habit and have kept it alive for many years. This train-going habit was indulged in as a sort of afternoon recreation, and it flourished like a vaudeville show until given a knockout jolt by the arrival of too many trains, so many trains that it induced tiresomeness and led up to the lingering death of the train-going habit, about the year of the opening of the present century. Um, so there's the train-going habit in Steinsville. Now, there's a lot of symbolic departures that took place at the Bloomington Depot, and of course, this first Bloomington Depot was in use during the Civil War. This is a slide of uh, Louisiana Zouaves. This is not in Bloomington. But going down to the depot to bid the soldiers farewell before they left town was a symbolic moment that was recorded multiple times at the Bloomington Depot. So this is from... Uh, May 10th, 1861. May 10th marched the marked the departure of this company for Camp Vigo, Terre Haute, and the whole town gathered at the railroad station to bid farewell to the boys. A Miss Mitchell presented the troop with a beautiful flag, and her presentation speech was responded to in original phrases by Lieutenant Black. The scene was a sorrowful one. Sweethearts, wives, mothers, sisters, and fathers watched their loved ones, pale-faced and silent, leave for the front. Some of them never to return. Uh, the scene was repeated in, throughout the summer of 61. In September uh, 14th, the Bloomington Republican recorded another moment. This company was raised mostly in this and Owen counties, a number of them being from the vicinity of Whitehall. While they were waiting for the train at the depot, a beautiful flag was presented to the company from the ladies of Whitehall. Governor Dunning, on behalf of the ladies, made a suitable address on the presentation of the flag, which was responded to by Captain Danes in a short address and by three cheers from the soldiers for their beautiful flag. This makes the seventh company, which has been raised principally in this county and left here for war. Now, it's interesting to note that they have this ceremony at the depot, the last place or the first place in Bloomington. They don't have it on the college campus. They don't have it on the courthouse lawn. Those would be suitable places but instead they have it at the depot. It's that gate function, right? They've come all the way up to the gate. Well, shortly after the Civil War, a few years, in May 2nd, 1868, Bloomington's first depot is burned. Uh, period sources do not state the cause. Here's our article. Uh, but Carter Pering in his speech put it down to lightning. That's good enough, I don't know. Sounds reasonable. In less than an hour from the time of its discovery, the entire edifice was a smoking ruin, with but bare walls left to show where the building had been. A quantity of, valuable, of valuables were in the depot, which together with every article in the freight and telegraph offices was entirely destroyed. The depot safe was recovered intact, along with its contents. So they had that going for them. But that's the end of the first depot. So it burned down and they built another one, depot number two. This time the railroads changed its name, but it's still the same railroad. The Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago. Uh, it's a brick combination depot, once again combining the features of freight and passenger service. And it was in use from 1868 to 1911. It was located in the same spot. And it was of the run-through type, and this we know for sure. The first one we surmise was of the run-through type. This one we can prove. Richard A. Folk and Company were contracted to build the depot. Uh, and in the meantime, Bloomington was served for several months by a temporary depot. They had a platform by Kirkwood, and they had a local mill that would sell tickets. So that was, that was how you got on the train in the meantime. So in August of 1868, they contracted to be built. It was going to be 100 feet long and 40 feet wide. Its design and style were very similar to the original depot. Pairing described it as shortened up at both ends. 
um, constructed in dimensions and rebuilt. So it's pretty much the same as the first one. So it's with that description, the evidence uh, that I presented about the cost of the depots that makes us think that they were, the first one was a run through as well. So here we finally have a diagram of the actual building. This is the, there's the second depot as it appeared in the Sanborn maps. Um, this maps from 1883. The depot was completed in November 9, or 1868. And it was, as I noted earlier, directly across from the Orchard Hotel. The Orchard Hotel outlasted the first depot. And they're still making money on the Mona. It appears in one photograph. And this, this photograph uh, is down at the library, hanging on the wall. Uh, one copy of it anyway. And in the background, you can just kind of make out there's some trains. And right here, there's the star of the show, the first photograph of a Bloomington Depot. Um, and of course, its relationship to downtown is very clear. And the photograph's taken from the courthouse top, not our courthouse today, but from the courthouse steeple. Here's a zoomed in picture. There's our depot. There's train on the main line. This, these boxcars right here are probably on the track that would line up to run through the depot. And back here in the middle distance, we can see the locomotive facilities for Bloomington, which were also right downtown. Everything was right downtown. When they built the railroad in 1854, it made sense to put everything right downtown. But as the years go on, the railroad starts to become more and more of a hindrance, and all this stuff's going to be moved out of the town eventually. Okay, so here we have a later Sanborn map that clearly shows our start of the show, run through depot, and the engine facilities that we could see in that photograph. And here's a really close up, blowing it up as much as I can. And there, there it is. So how did one of these depots work? Well, let's go back to uh, the original Gosport depot picture. Passengers are all going to come in on one side of the depot. So to go back, passengers are all going to be unloaded on this side of the building. They're going to come in on this platform. Freight is going to come in to the building itself, not passenger trains. Matter of fact, I don't think Passenger trains probably very rarely, if ever, dropped off a car inside that depot. Mainline pa passenger trains stay on the main line. They make a stop and they keep going, right? They don't want to do a bunch of switching. The freight cars would be shunted into the depot, but I doubt the trains ever ran through. That would have been an almost suicidal proposition. For one thing, the amount of smoke would have just choked out the inhabitants of the building. And for the other thing, the risk of fire. Sure, the building's made of brick, but the inside isn't. And so you can imagine what a steam locomotive would be like belching through that building. So instead, they're going to push the cars in with other cars, maybe even use a spacer car, but they're never going to drive a train through that building. They're going to unload them in it, but they're not going to drive through it. So here we have the other reason I have this Gosport picture. Look at these chimneys. That's to help deal with the smoke that's probably on the platform. That's what I surmise. I don't have direct evidence. But I believe that those four chimneys probably have something to do with the smoke that's coming off, just on the outside, on the platform. Can't imagine that being inside. Um, and here's another picture of the Gosport Depot, showing more clearly the passenger, loading on air, the passenger unloading area. And this is the later depot in Gosport, and it shows very clearly the run-through part of it. From the outside, we can also tell what part of the deep, what each room of the depot was used for. Since the passengers are unloading here, this part is the passenger portion of the depot. And this is where the ticket office is going to be, um, and passenger baggage is going to be stored. This half of the building is going to be used for freight. And that's where all the freight's going to be stored, that's stored in the building. 
Once again, I don't have anything for Bloomington, but I can show you Gosport. This is the uh, a scale drawing of the Gosport Depot where they've taken away the walls so we can see what it was like on the inside. Here's the freight portion. Here's the passenger portion. Right here, this little bump out that window, that's the telegrapher is going to sit there. That's in the ticket office. And this shows we've got the waiting room, we've got the baggage freight, got freight that's for boxcars here. And the outside of the Gosport Depot, showing clearly the passenger waiting area. OK, so this is 1892 Sanborn map. This is. Uh, Actually, the first one is 83, then 87. Notice it says ticket office on this side of the building. Keeps appearing. They keep mapping it. This is inside the Gosport Depot. Now, why did they get rid of this sort of depot? Why, why not have every depot be a run-through type? Well, for two reasons. One, you lose that space where the track is. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with that space? It has to be kept open for the track. Two, you've got this trench in the middle of your building. And so to get from one side to the other, notice there are walls, but to, there are a few openings. There are some doorways. To get from one side to the other, you either have to climb down the trench, climb up the other side so they have ladders, or they might park a flat car or a box car in there, and then you could use the car to cross over. But, but you lose the space. And you've got the danger of the trench in the middle of your building. So it's better off, maybe, to get rid of this type. And so what the railroad winds up doing is they wind up remodeling the building. So sometime between 1892 and 1898, the building, the depot was remodeled. I bet it was closer to 1892 when they also moved uh, the, the engine servicing facilities to McDowell. So what they do is they take the track out of the middle of the building and they move it over here to the side. Now all the freight unloading is done on this platform. The passenger unloading is done on this platform. The building is still freight on this side, passenger on this side, but it's no longer of the run-through type. Now we have some good close-ups of the building after it's been remodeled. Uh, this is after it's no longer the run-through formation. Here's the passengers waiting on the platform. Here's the southbound train. Here's the E protecting the passengers. This door leads into the freight room. Here's the freight office behind this door. Notice this downspout. Why would you put a downspout, drain it towards the middle of your building? Well, I imagine that it's going into the old drain that used to drain the railroad track that ran through the center of the building. And that's why they do this. Otherwise, you just run the downspout down the corner. But they're going towards that old drain. So I think that's evidence that this is the run-through depot in its remodeled form. Here's another slide of it. And you can just barely make out the brick archway there, where they've bricked that in and turned this into a square door. That's a lot of students heading home. And you see there's multiple trains. This depot was a busy place. Um, and here's a picture from the freight end of the building. So this is where the wagons are going to come in and pick up the freight. The cars are going to be over here just off the picture. And then, of course, the passenger stuff's happening on this side. Now, a weird thing happens. All around the depot down there is this area that people in Bloomington start calling the levee. Well, I know what a levee is. Levee's that spot along the flat spot along the river where you could unload your river boats. But Bloomington doesn't have a river. This is uh, Pittsburgh. This is St. Louis. So why do they call this area, the area down around the depot, the levee? Well, the answer lies in the social function. All these buildings along here, well, there's a mixture of warehouses, and there's a mixture of restaurants, but there's an awful lot of saloons and other places like billiard halls and flop houses and houses of ill repute 
And they all sprang up in the sort of rough area along the waterfront. Well, guess what? That area down around the depot in Bloomington became known as the levee for the same reasons. <clears throat> so this is, uh, what are you looking at here? This is 1898 Sanborn map. And the buildings, it tells you what they do at each building. So we've got our Orchard Hotel, and we've got a saloon there, and we've got a saloon there. But, I don't know, it doesn't seem too unreasonable. A couple of saloons, you might get thrown out of one for a while, so you had to have another one to go to, you know. But now let's uh, get the slides right here. Now let's look at, the, this is, actually, I said the wrong one before. This is 1898. Saloon, 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 restaurant, billiards. So, and restaurant, bowling alley. Pretty fun part of town. And all sorts of stuff happens down in this part of town. This is uh, July 21st, 1906. There's a fight down there. People are cut up with knives. Bloomington's not going to have any drinks on the train anymore uh, because of some rowdiness that's been going on. That's uh, 1907. Here's 1907 Sanborn. They've cleaned it up a little. We've got saloon, saloon, moving pictures, Penny Arcade, barbershop, lodge halls, saloon. So, still pretty happening. This is a map from the 1909 IU yearbook, and it shows the things that are important to students. We've got, there's, there's IU, Indiana Avenue, Kirkwood. Down here we have the pool room, pool room, pool room. Here's the depot, shows our nice levee area. Somewhere in here there's a blind tiger. Bloomington goes in and out with prohibition. Sometimes you can buy drinks in Monroe County, sometimes you can't, and it's dry. And over the years, it switches with political parties. And so when you couldn't buy a drink legally, you could get one from a blind tiger, which was essentially an unlicensed saloon. And they're raiding a levy gambling game. 19 men are pinched. Uh, that's December 1911. Fifteen caught in a police net. Uh, Fifteen women and men were caught in the police dragnet Saturday night, and as a result, the office of the mayor was filled almost to overflowing this afternoon. There were six women in the lot, and the charges were for associating prostitution and frequenting at the House of Ill Fame. The house in question is located on North Morton, once again, down in the levee. Also notice the women were charged, and no mention about the men. The mayor probably knew them. So that's 1912. Uh, in 1913, they were getting a blind tiger. And of course, where is it? North Morton. They tried to dry out the levee. Make it all illegal, but that doesn't really work. This is uh, December 2nd, 1913. And even though Agent Humpston is to keep the station clean, there's still the drunken rowdies that are coming in. And this is an article about a drunken rowdy that passed out in the depot, and the agent had to get, get him out of there. So that's 1914. Police, they move the police down to the levee. Let's headquarter the police on the levee and see if that doesn't clean it up. It didn't. That's 1915. And even if you make it all illegal and you put the police down on the levee, they were still raiding places. This is a drugstore that was selling an awful lot of wet goods when they should have only been selling dry. <laughs> Ten cases of whiskey, gin, and wines, one full barrel. So, a little bit of drinking going on in the levee. So that's what's going on around depot number two. <laughs> now let's get to depot number three. This is built by 
the second railroad and only other railroad to come to Bloomington. This is the Indianapolis Southern. It's a limestone passenger depot. It only has one function, no freight in this one. It's built in 1906 and it serves until 1945 when they end passenger service. Um, it's located north of 13th Street between College and Walnut. The baggage room still exists today. The rest of the depot does not. And built at the same time, because if you're only going to have passenger function in the one depot, you had to have your freight function in another. So they built a freight depot, also Indianapolis Southern. It's a brick and wood frame. This building still stands, although it's been modified. Uh, in 1922, they added a second story. Um, it's at 7th and Morton. It served from 1906 to 1969. Now in 1870, having just one railroad is acceptable. I mean, look, most of, lots of the country doesn't even have a railroad. And so here we can see there's, there's the Monon coming through Bloomington. Bloomington's right about there. So they had one. They're not doing bad. But by 1890, having just one railroad seemed to be a detriment. And notice, the upper Midwest in particular is covered in railroads. So Bloomington looking at the progress going on around them are saying, we need another railroad. And look at this Appalachia essentially stretches all the way through here. There are very few railroads. It's hard to build railroads in the hills. So city boosters start agitating. They want another railroad. Uh, and that means businessmen mostly. And they want a railroad that's going to connect Where's Bloomington? There's Bloomington. You can always tell it's above the bump out here on the Monon. There's Bloomington. They want to connect to Indianapolis. Now, the Monon will get some great to Chicago and pretty great to Louisville. But to get to Indianapolis, you have to change trains in Greencastle or Crawfordsville or Gosport. Back to that Gosport depot again. This is the building that people from Bloomington would come in on. They'd come in this direction. They'd get off at, into this part of the building. Then they'd have to get up the hill to this building. That's the Pennsylvania Railroad Depot. They're not connected. No Union Station in Gosport. To get up that hill, you had to go on this path right here. This is from the 1913 flood, but it clearly shows the path between the two depots. Imagine the train comes screeching in. You gather up all your baggage. You go up the hill, you wait for the other train to arrive, it's a pain. And so they want to avoid this pain. They want a direct line to Indianapolis. And this is eventually the railroad that they get. Here's Bloomington. It runs pretty much straight to Indianapolis. Now, It gets bought. It starts out as the little old Indianapolis Southern. That's what it's going to be built as, Bloomington to Indianapolis. And it's, maybe it's kind of vague about where it would have gone after that. Um, but before they ever get it completed, while they're building it, uh, they start to run out of, of money. In 1902, they start with the plans. The surveys are started in 1902. Um, 1903, they start construction. They start grading on all points on the railroad. Um, by 1904, they've got a franchise through Bloomington. So that's a, a granted a route through the city. Um, but then things start going bad. They run out of money. Work comes to a halt. They can't pay their contractors. It looks like the railroad might not get built. And then at the last minute, the Illinois Central swoops in and buys it up. Now, the Illinois Central is so big, I can barely get it on one slide. Went all the way from New Orleans to Chicago. Here's the Indiana branch that they bought up, just so they could have a connection to Indianapolis. So it goes from being the sole purpose of the railroad Indianapolis to southern Indiana to now just a part of the Illinois Central system. Now here's where it came through town. This was the very north edge of town at the time. There really wasn't much out beyond this. This is the North Pike that headed out towards Martinsville. Um, here's the Illinois Central. Here's the Monon. There's the Monon Depot. Right here is where the Illinois Central will put their freight depot, and right there is where they'll put their passenger depot. 
That's a map from 1907. Here we are today. Let's see, where are we? There's College. There's Walnut. There's the depot. It's still shown as a place where you can drink for a while. It was a bar called The Rail that my brother owned, um, of all things. They thought about putting the depot at the end of Lincoln Street, right here, where it was flat. But instead, they decided to go with the spot closer to the, to the courthouse, closer to downtown. And this is where they built it. This is the baggage room, all that's left. The actual original depot would have been right here. And that's what it looked like. It was a handsome building. Wish that one would have lasted. The platforms for the passengers actually stretched out over the streets, College and Walnut there. Here's the site earlier this uh, year. There's the baggage room. Now, the drawback of building the depot there was that they had to put in a whole bunch of fill. Forty feet of fill had to be put in here. When they first built this, this line is, goes through town uh, at an elevation for much of the line. And this portion right in here was all a wood trestle, all the way up to where the depot was. The depot they put on wood pilings, and then they built another trestle on the other side. So it was essentially a wood trestle all the way across College and Walnut. After they put in the pilings, they took uh, earth and filled it all in so the, to make a little hill there. So that's where the, the depot site was. Here's the freight depot right here. And they stuck it downtown. It's on the end of a spur. You can't put your passenger depot on a spur. It's got to be on the main line. But to freight depot, you can put on a spur, a dead end track. And so, where do you put it? You put it by Showers Brothers, right? Right downtown, right off of Morton, not far from where the Monon would be just down here. In the heart of the industrial district, that's where you'd put your freight depot. And here it is today, still hanging out at 7th and Morton. And here we have a Sanborn map showing where the depot will be. OK, so it gets us through the first two railroad depots. Now the Monon's turn. They're going to redo their depot. So it's now called the Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville. Still the same railroad, still in the same spot, but a new corporate organization. Uh, they're going to build a limestone passenger depot. Passenger only, once again, just they've split the functions. And it's going to be in use from 1912 to 1966. And it's in the exact same place between 4th and 5th on Morton now. It was Railroad Street. They renamed it. If you split the functions, you've got to build the other building. And so they built a freight depot directly across the tracks from their passenger depot. This was on Kirkwood Avenue, uh, right in the same area, 1912 to 1966, same dates. So here's our old Bloomington Depot. And this is what they're going to, this is the map of what they're going to replace it with. This is going to be the new depot here. Here's the freight depot just across the tracks. And it's angled so that it lines up with these tracks. This is what it was proposed to look like. Um, but it doesn't quite look like that when they built it. Here's the actual building showing the, the grounds. They've got some nice grass there. And showing it from the other side. Uh, so in July 1911, they closed the old brick depot. And on July 26th, they demolished the brick depot. The other depot was under construction. And in the meantime, they used a boxcar uh, on Kirkwood Avenue as their depot. The passenger depot was described lovingly in multiple sources. The Bloomington Daily Telephone boasted that the station will be the finest one between Chicago and Louisville and will be constructed of Monroe County stone with shelter sheds, large waiting rooms for women, smoking rooms for men, large port cochier on the east side for cabs, carriages, and automobiles. The block between Kirkwood Avenue and 4th Street will be laid out with drives, walks, lawns, and shrubbery, and cluster lights. So there's, there's our... Port Coucher, 
There's our covered platform, or not platform, but outside waiting areas. Our lawns. In March 1912, the telephone described the interior. The main waiting room is becoming a thing of beauty. The ceiling is a cement groin one and is very pretty. On each side, just below the roof, are three eyebrow windows. Hey, there are windows. Mm -hmm. A new scheme of illumination is to be used, the linolite illumination, in which none of the light globes can be seen. Around the walls, just above the windows, a very pretty hollow molding has been formed, and in this hollow, the electric lights are hidden. Their light is thrown against a white ceiling, which in turn reflects it back to the room below, having a very novel effect. A bubbling sanitary fountain is maintained for drinking purposes. Above the ticket window, an electric clock is to be embedded in the cement with artistic mountings. A railing has been placed in front of the ticket window so that only one person can be buying at a time. At the opposite end of the room, a small fireplace has been built, and above this is, a carve, is carved a monogram containing the letters C-I-L, standing for the railroad. <coughs> the building was opened May 23, 1912. And from this picture, we can once again see the function of the building on the outside. There's the ticket agent's going to be behind this window and the telegrapher. This end is going to be the baggage for the passengers. This end is going to be the passenger waiting room. And then these are used for, to store the baggage carts. Here's a picture of the freight depot that was just across the tracks. Very functional building. I don't have any glowing reports about it. Really, the only ornamentation, it had limestone lintels. Otherwise, it's pretty plain brick building. But it's built for a function, right? It's going to take the freight off the boxcars. It could be stored in this building, and then it can be picked up by trucks. Here we have a picture of the, the new Monon Depot. And this is in, uh, this is greeting troops from World War I. Now, remember the idea of uh, that dooryard area? This is a hotel right here. These people are all uh, gathered here to say their farewells or their hellos, just like before. <laughs> Look at that. There's my telephone pole. <laughs> so here's greeting the troops. Everybody turned out in town. That's amazing. There are all these cars are here. You would expect to see like one team, one wagon in the picture, but no, it's everybody's driving cars. There's the freight depot in the background. So here's go back to the, our idea of the of what's around the depot. We've still got our saloons, lots of them, um, but we also. See the Gentry Hotel pop up? That's a block, a block north of the depot. And the Gentry Hotel is going to become the Bowles Hotel. Here's the Bowles Hotel, a fixture of downtown Bloomington for years. But once again, it's located in this area around the depot. You're not going to go far from the depot with your bags when you go to get to your hotel. It's all built within walking distance or a very short cab ride. And those cabs, the JT Bright Transfer Company, is headquartered at Hotel Bowles, all right down in that same area, so that you can get your cab right to the hotel. Here's a close-up of the fancy cab. Now, about this time, people start identifying the depot buildings as symbolic to Bloomington. The first few depots, they don't really do that. You don't see a lot of evidence of them conflating the building with Bloomington. But now, the building means something. And so if you have an old rundown depot, heaven forbid, you have an old rundown town. So you want to have a nice new modern depot. And this goes in with this idea of city beautiful movement. In the 1890s it took off. And if you built a better city, you'd make better people. More parks, nicer buildings, cleaner. You'd have a cleaner, nicer populace. This is the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And this is what they called the white city because it was all gleaming white. Um, and it's where the Beaux Arts style really first takes off in the United States. And so people in rustic little Bloomington are looking around and they've seen this stuff. They've seen the Columbian Exposition. 
and they think, man, we got to fix up our town, so we're going to get rid of the old courthouse, which has its charm, I think. But they said it was a mishmash of styles. Look at this. Greek columns with, with that tower, please. Let's replace it with something really nice. And so this is the courthouse in early days. Notice there's really nothing around it, no, no growth. But here we've got that Beaux Arts dome that they're copying straight off of that Columbian Exposition. And that's in Chicago, right? If Chicago can do it, we can too. Well, so at the same era, both of the train depots, the passenger train depots, are going to be ornamented in a way that they weren't before. And that's why they're talking in glowing terms about the Monon Depot and why I will tell you in glowing terms about the Illinois Central Depot. The buildings are symbolic. Here's what W.T. Hicks, who's one of the promoters of the Indianapolis Southern that becomes Illinois Central, said about the, the depot and its spot. I sought the earliest opportunity to show Mr. Baldwin, he was the constructing engineer, the possibilities of making a beauty spot here between College Avenue and Walnut Street, a sort of observatory from which to view the pretty landscape, the delight of the weary traveler, and the constant joy of appreciative home people. So, it's a beauty spot. Skipped ahead there. He also described it, he described the view from the platform. On a clear June morning, did you ever stand on the platform of the Indianapolis Southern Depot and feast your eyes upon the beauty of the landscape stretching out toward the north, starting off as it does with rugged contours, then receding in easy declivity until the eye is scanned miles of distance, then rising until a long great wall of verdure touches the, and blends with the sky. If you have not you have doubtless traveled far and praised a lesser prospect. So the idea of a depot is a beautiful spot. A depot is a symbolic place. It's a beautiful spot. Bloomington's a beautiful place. And it happens with the Monon Depot as well. That's why they're going in for the landscaping. We've got flowers. We've got grass. We've, we've got this ornamental approach to the depot where you're going to pull up in your carriage, get off into the depot, come out the other side, board your train. Highly elegant. This shows the, the grounds from an aerial view in the 1930s. Here's our freight depot. Here's our passenger depot. These borders, they had to put bushes around the grass because one of the complaints was people keep cutting across the grass and they're killing our grass. So they planted it with, bordered it with bushes to protect their, their nice lawn. It's, they have a lawn, but they don't want anybody to use it. And then there's a close-up of that Illinois Central Depot and the, its beauty spot. Now, here's the Illinois Central Depot a little later on. Notice it's missing, actually. The, the passenger depot itself is gone. Um, the Illinois Central would petition to end passenger service as a temporary wartime measure in 1945. It would never resume. Uh, there was a series of, it was hearings before the ICC, lasted all the way up until 1947, but there would never be another train. Um, and so then in the interim, the depot was destroyed by fire and the baggage uh, room was saved. And there's the baggage room today, all that's left of it. This part was added on later. And this sort of sits on the, what would have been the footprint of the passenger depot. So if the passenger depots were a part of the city beautiful movement, the freight depots were really the commercial cornerstones of town. And everything, and I mean everything that came to Bloomington, came through those two buildings. Everything. And so it could be rightly called a daily miracle, the amount of stuff that railroads were delivering. Last year, two million freight cars uh, on the American Railroads traveled more than 19 billion miles. Now this is the Association of American Railroads advertisement. Um, but it gives you an idea of the sort of, the enormity of freight that was hauled. So here we are, the Indianapolis Southern Freight House, and again today. This is what it looks like today. Now basically what would happen on this side of the building, cars 
trucks would pull up and stuff would be unloaded out of the building. And on this side of the building, boxcars would pull up and be unloaded into the building. This is the boxcar side where they would have been pulled up. This is the office portion of the building. And this back here was the warehouse portion of the building. This is a brick firewall built in between the two. You don't want your building to be burned down. And if you're going to lose it, you're going to lose half of it. There, how about that? So. Here it is when it was in really rough shape. We're lucky this building survived at all. And this is survived because of the generosity of Bill and Gail Cook, who actually restored it. But this shows the uh, boxcar side. You can still see some tracks here. And then here's the street side. And these awnings protected you as you loaded and unloaded. Trucks would have pulled up. There would have been doors. The trucks would have pulled up to these doors. And this is not from Bloomington. I said I also worked on Roanoke. This is from Roanoke, Virginia. But it shows you exactly how these buildings worked, right? You're essentially just a, a covered platform where you're going to store freight until it can be loaded into those trucks. Now, here's an example. This is from Bloomington. This is the, there's a little platform in between. The freight depot would be off this side. The passenger depot would be off that side. And in between, there's a little open platform. This is on the team track called the team track because you would take your horse team up there and you would unload from the boxcar onto the platform onto your horse team. Well, they still are doing it, except now they're doing it in trucks. Um, so a lot of freight, if it was just going to be in coming off the boxcar, maybe it'd only take you a few minutes to unload it, you wouldn't even mess with the freight depot. You'd just do it right there on that platform. But it, maybe you couldn't pick it up till tomorrow. Maybe the train came in in the middle of the night. Maybe the boxcar was less than carload freight, so it wasn't a whole boxcar full. You were just getting part of a boxcar. Then that might get moved into the depot. Another, the iron firemen, they're stoves. They're unloading stoves delivered over the Monon. Nobody ever takes a picture of di like normal daily life. I dare you to go home and take a picture of nothing. <laughs> it's always a reason, right? There's some reason they take a picture. So I struggle. I'm always like, why didn't anybody take a picture? Sure. Uh, this is a series of about a half a dozen photographs of the arrival of the iron fireman. The iron fireman was a stoker that was pour your coal into and would auger in over a period of time, keeping your house regulated. It was uh, at the end of the age of having uh, uh, coal shoveled by hand by uh, individual <coughs> firemen. The stokers were automatic, and in the morning the the uh, clinker men would come and they would refill your stoker and take the clinkers out. Maybe again the same thing in the afternoon. And you had a coal uh, pit in your basement. So Iron Farm, and I forget the name of the company, but, that was your, but this is about one of a half a dozen photos. And we have one of the Monon Society of this particular car being delivered with a switch engine attached to it, an 060 switch engine. Uh, for those of you who know about uh, railroad and, and the type of locomotives, was a steam engine. George, they sold those iron firemen stokers out of the Valley Coal Company right here at Second Rogers. Right. Yeah. So thank you for that aside. Um, and that's, ex that's exactly the era, you know, we're looking at the 1930s here. And that was after World War II. Or 40s, apparently. <laughs> now, back to the freight depot. Um, somewhere here. Here we are. We've got the truck. It's loading and it's unloading. Here are the aerial. The freight. There's where that little platform was off the team track. Here, this car is probably on the team track. These are cars in between the platform, and the freight depot. All of these cars are going to be unloaded for Bloomington. Well, what sort of things came through the freight depot? Well, here's a pretty good list. Right here. Everything that's for sale in all those downtown stores. Everything from axle grease, almonds, clothespins, pecans, black pepper, black cayenne, pickles, pipes, paper, rice. And this is... Uh, let's see if I got the date on this. 1867. 
So that's pretty early when they're getting all these goods. But it's all going to come through deep, the depot. Or jewelries, novelties, sure. Christmas supplies. So this is in December, and you can get, in Bloomington, fresh oysters, cranberries, celery, lettuce, radishes, sweet potatoes, cauliflower, fresh fruits and vegetables coming in on the Monon or coming in through the depot. I like this tailoring ad. Good, reliable tailoring. Okay. Christmas footwear, Baldwin pianos, Victrolas, all of it coming in through the depot. Even things you wouldn't expect, like movies. In 1913, there's a flood. And one of the things that happens is the picture shows can't show any more movies because the trains can't get through that are carrying the reels. Everything comes through the depot. An electric iron for Christmas? Who's pushing that? Central Indiana Lighting Company, right? The more appliances you have, the more power that they can sell. So kind of a last hurrah, I like to think of it, for the Monon depots downtown was the civic celebration of the Monon Centennial of 1947. And there's my picture. That's what was going on. Everybody was down here to see this old time train. That's a Baltimore, Ohio, William Mason. And the Monon didn't have any locomotives left over from 100 years ago. And so they had to borrow one. So they got this one from the Baltimore and Ohio. They're big enough to keep a few old locomotives around. But the Monon, they traded their old ones in. They got new locomotives. They were always run on a shoestring. So it's 1947. They're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the railroad. They've got the William Mason in town. There's my telephone pole. Everything is coming together. There's the William Mason. There's William Mason today. You can still go to Baltimore and see it. Green, apparently. And these are the crowd of people that were down there that day. I mean, it's just this, really a who's who, I guess. Everybody's wearing these nice hats, it's white shirts, summertime. We got the patriotic bunting up, garland. And I always suspected this photo was taken the same day because there's the same sort of crowd. Um, we have our garland here again. But I wasn't for sure. I mean, I couldn't guarantee it until I saw this guy. There's the guy in the first picture. I think there he is in the second picture. And this is where I need to stop spending so much time on this stuff. Right? <laughs> Talking about that uh, dooryard, the place for all your services around the depot. Here's the Pullman Hotel. This is the hotel that, that's missing now. Yeah, there's some, somebody's hanging out the window. Hanging out the window, watching the stuff going on. It's this right here is the post holding up a roof over that uh, team track platform. And that roof appears in 19, somewhere before 1947, and it disappears sometime in 1966 or thereabouts. And there, that's right, there's my telephone pole. So that was the, the centennial. And then we go on through the years. This is in the 50s. I think it's dated 59. Um, this is uh, probably the thoroughbred stopping at Bloomington. Here's, here's the depot a little bit later. I'm sorry. I wondered if you had any pictures of us when they ran the train. Bloomington uh, to the Ellis Fall Festival in the late 50s. I, I went with my family. I don't have any of those pictures. You okay. If you do, you can send them my I, way. I'd have to ask my dad. And, uh, I'm my always. Mom might have put, she passed a year ago, but um, I, I still have yet to see, but, and I can't really picture the station. I can remember riding on the train with my grandma and my mom's dad. But, yeah, I can well, you're ahead of me. I never have gotten to take a train out no, of Bloomington, and I never will. <laughs> So, well, let's go back one. So, you know, the building's starting to wear here around the windows. They've closed in this end portion. This, they had enough baggage that they're going to expand the baggage room over here as well. We've got the Graham Hotel poking up in the background now. 
And remember those pretty gardens and lawns around the depot? <laughs> remember telephone booths? All those lawns and gardens have been replaced with, what do you need now in the 1950s and 60s? Parking. Got to have parking. Everybody drives to the depot. It was also the Greyhound bus uh, ticket agency. Was right. Yes. Ran. More amazement. So I, like, I love this sign right here. Private parking violators. Cars will be rolled or towed away. <laughs> Better be careful. Who knows where they'll roll it? Yeah. Let's see. So now parking. It's an automobile world, right? It's taking over the depots themselves. This is uh, students going home for the holidays. I think it's 1963. Once again, students, same day. All right. Now the shortest lived of all the Bloomington depots. Still mown on, Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville. It's the Limestone Passenger Depot. It was in service November 1966 to September 67. Didn't even make a year. And it was located at Grimes Lane uh, at the head of McDowell Yard there. And it, the building's still in existence today. Now, why would you build a new passenger depot at that time? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, November, here we've got the order. November 28, 1966, we're going to close down the passenger station at Bloomington. Look, new station located at Grimes will be opened. So that means the fate, this depot is going to be torn down. Once again, a, a sad moment. Uh, notice the team track platform's already gone. The freight depot won't last much, much longer. Here the tracks have been pulled up, the parking lot's already encroaching all around it. So by 1966, these buildings are slated for demolition, and Monon's going to get out of downtown Bloomington, and they're going to sell off that property, and they're not going to pay expensive property taxes on those lots. That's part of what influenced the decision. Also, it's declining passenger numbers. So what happened to this fine example of a depot? I ask people about it. They say, well, they tore it down. Well, yeah, okay. So they like blow it up? No, they just they tore it down. So then what did they do with the rubble? Well, I have a story for that. My friend Pete Pettigo knows some truck driver who supposedly trucked the rubble of the Monon Depot to the north side of town where they were working on uh, 37 by the visitor center there, by Blue Ridge. And that hill had a bunch of fill. It's the hill just east of Cascades Park. That hill had a bunch of fill that was dumped in there at that time. So I went to Cascades Park, and I climbed up that hill. And sure enough, it is just littered with architectural stone. Now is it from the depot? I can't prove that. But it's certainly from buildings that were torn down. Because we've got stuff like the mortar still on the stone, right? This is stone that was built into something. It's not just quarry scrap. And there's all sorts of, I mean, there's bricks, there's limestone chunks, clay tile. There's my research assistant, my son James, my other research assistant, my dog Blue. <laughs> he's, he's holding a tile fragment that was on that hillside. So that's probably where the old depot wound up. And here's what it was replaced with. This is the passenger depot, and it later become the yard office at McDowell. Um, it's open for business. 7.01 a.m., November 28, 1966. And it's the epitome of modern. Got our plastic chairs in the waiting room there. We got ashtrays back when people smoked in buildings. Here's the office part of the depot. Typewriters. So really, in my notes here, I have one word about it, modern. There's not a whole lot else to say because it wasn't used very long at all. Here's a locating photo. Here's Grimes Lane. There it is. This is the railroad yard stretching down here. Here's the asphalt platform marked. That was where you would stand to catch the train. And there's the building. And that's about it. Some photo of my good buddy Ron Marquardt took this. Still in the Monon hands, but I think it's probably after its passenger days or, or near the end of them. Building used before that, other than for 
No, it was just built. Now you wonder, this is, she has a good question, was this building used before that? Why would you just build a building for passenger station and then you're going to quit passenger service in a year? And they, they're already by this time moving to quit passenger service. They're filing forms, they're trying to get away from running passenger trains. They're going to use this building as a yard office. That's what they're going to do with it. It's going to replace, we'll get ahead of me here. Um, this is the thoroughbred. This is Monon's last passenger train. Um, and it was still running into the uh, mid to late 1960s, but on September 30th, 1967, it made its last run. These aren't pictures of its last run, but that's also the thoroughbred. So when that train makes its last run, there's no reason to have a passenger depot anymore, and so then that passenger depot takes over its new role as yard office. And you can see where it's located right at the head of the yards. It makes sense. And it replaced the old yard office. And this building gave me fits. And I don't even want to go into the hours of work I put in trying to decide whether or not that was a depot. I have some evidence. It's listed in some sources as a depot. But no regular trains ever stopped there. So I don't think that it was used as a depot. There we have the telegrapher. And I think these are his runners for the Western Union office that was in that building. They also used it as a yard office. but. Probably never a depot. Was that in the same location? That's in, that's in McDowell. It was right down there. Okay. And eventually they put a siding in for this warehouse. And they cut the eaves off that poor building. And it just got in the way. And so then they, they tore it down and moved the operation. That photo was backwards. That two, that two windows and that end right there, that's the north end of it, actually. It's been flipped. Yep. And I could talk a lot more about this picture, but I just won't because <laughs> we've got to go on. Here's what this proud passenger depot winds up looking like. Now, to go back to that idea of the dooryard, the area around the, the depot, look at all the hotels moved out north. They all moved out towards the intersection of 45, 46, and 37. Holiday and days in Hampton. This is a more modern map. But they all used to be down here. So when the depot moves out of town, the hotels move out of town, the whole area is dead and gone. Notice this prominent winery is featured there. <laughs> Last depot. Amtrak, concrete block passenger waiting shed. Served from 1975 to 79, so it outlasted the Monon's last depot. It was on West Kirkwood, opposite side of the tracks from the original Monon depots. Now, Bloomington was never meant to have Amtrak service. What happened was uh, Amtrak wound up coming here incidentally. And that's a perfect word for the whole interlude of Amtrak in Bloomington. The tracks were too bad. Here's an early Amtrak train. That's down by Harrodsburg. Let me see if I can find it. Oh. Somewhere I have a slide. I don't know if I'll ever get to it. Of the Penn Central. Penn Central had taken over. It merged the New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroads. It had been a disaster. And their trackage was in really bad shape in Indianapolis. And so the Amtrak train had gone from Chicago to Indianapolis on down to Point South. This is the train, the Floridian. But it was too, the tracks were too bad, so they had to reroute the Floridian. So they took it off, out of Indianapolis, off the Penn Central tracks, and they moved it onto the Monon tracks, which was now owned uh, by the l and Monon had really good trackage. They would kept great shape of their, which is interesting because they're such a small railroad, but they, one of the criticisms was they took too good care of their line. Um, so Amtrak's moved to the Monon, so it's now going to go by Bloomington. But it doesn't stop. At first it just drives by the town. Because there's no depot, Amtrak doesn't want to make the train stop. So there, there's Amtrak driving by Bloomington. But eventually they get Amtrak to stop. Um, so in March 1975 the Amtrak trains rerouted. Uh, by September of 75, they get it to stop. 
So from March to September, it just drove by. September, it starts stopping in Bloomington. The first scheduled stop was September 15, 1975, and it was in the middle of the night, well, not the middle, 3 a.m. Uh, the southbound train was coming in, and it arrived a little bit late, 3.12 a.m. There was a little bit of fanfare. The mayor showed up. This is a cartoon of Mayor Frank McCloskey. Uh, showed up waiting, for, waiting to meet the train. Uh, some of the common council members spoke when the train stopped, uh, but there weren't any crowds. Twelve people got off, uh, or twelve people were there th with three taxi cabs to meet the train. Five got off, two got on. And that sort of sums up how Amtrak service was for Bloomington. It wasn't used by a lot of people. After asking where the crowds were, Mayor Frank McCloskey gave a short speech and then announced that he wanted to go home. <laughs> go home and go to sleep. So here's, that's what it looked like coming in the middle of the night into Bloomington. This is uh, 4th Street, I think. Here they are handing up orders at McDowell. He's hooping up the orders there for the Amtrak engineer. So you want to see the depot? <laughs> this is the only picture I've ever found of this depot. It's like the first one and the last one were the hardest to find. Um, well, and there's a reason for that, I guess. This is the former police motorcycle storage shed. <laughs> and the city of Bloomington appropriated it for use as a depot. It was located near to the tracks uh, off of 5th Street. This shows you sort of, there's, here's the carpet coming from our shed. There's the First National Bank, just to kind of get you oriented there. So there it is. Um, I have a description of it. This is the only description of it. There's no con this is May 1976. There's no concourse, no luggage stand, no ticket office. The waiting room is an old shed last used to store motorcycles. There's no ticket agent, only a telephone booth and a sign instructing those interested to call Chicago to determine if the train is on time. The 10 by 20 foot shed has no lights and few remaining windows. Three crumpled beer cans lie against one wall. An old space heater has been torn from the wall. Welcome to Bloomington. <laughs> so, that's it. There's the people waiting. They're going to get on the train. This train's pretty late. It's here during the day. The Floridian would sometimes be hours late. Uh, on either end of its trip, up to like four hours would be fairly normal. Here they are boarding. Here it shows the platform. Here's our walkway to our shed. There's our <laughs> platform, which was just a strip of asphalt, which cost the city $800. The total, that's total renovations to the shed and the asphalt. <laughs> And here, this is my favorite Amtrak picture. We've got our beautiful Beau Arts courthouse, right, announcing the pride of place. And then we've got this crappy little concrete block station um, for people to, to get off at. And that's the end of it, because on October 9th, 1979, the train was discontinued. And it was, they cited loss of ridership, rising costs. Congress has always tried to require Amtrak to make money, which is funny because Amtrak was founded to rescue passenger rail service from the railroads who couldn't make money. So it's sort of a strange circular, circular reasoning there. But uh, on October 9, 1979, the last train stopped in Bloomington and none have ever returned. There's a one last thing though. It, they ripped out the old Monon Railroad, right here. Here's the, here's the, and this is Pete, who actually was in charge of getting these signals, taking the signals down. So they ripped out the Monon. There's nothing left of that anymore. But the day they ripped out the Monon, my telephone pole was still down there. <laughs> so it outlasted. All of it, really. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the last couple of years, somebody took down the telephone pole and nobody called me beforehand to <laughs> tell me about it. 
And so that's the end of it. So that's the history of Bloomington's railroad depots. Thank you very much. <laughs> Question. You could have made a case for the historic preservation folks about that telephone <laughs> They were required to stay there forever. Forever, with a little black on it. And the thing that, you know, it's leaning in every photo, and I, that's what just seems so transient. It's not going to be there for long, yet it endured. Kind of like a lot of us, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Any co other questions? Uh, I noticed that the Gospel Depot was really close to the White River, mm -hmm. which flooded all the time. I wonder why they built so close. Do you know because of the... There, you, the railroad's often tied to the river because of the topography, you know, so they're trying to not go up and down in as many hills. And uh, so they're, they're lower down from the town of Gosport proper is actually up above that depot. So they're hugging that bank. But it's still a ways down from there to the river. But it did flood, yeah. Other questions? There was a little spring that was located right near the Illinois Central Track, and it became known as the Illinois Central Spring. It becomes famous later on because it's polluted, I think, with PCBs, right? Right, the lemon. The landfill runs through, comes out of that. They got a water treatment plant in there, trying to get the PCBs out. Right. Well, you could go back there and you could see their little water treatment plant where they're trying to clean up the water from the spring. That's pretty much all that's down that road, as far as I know. Right. The Bloomington Southern. Yes. I how, how are they connected? Was there any passenger service? There's no regular passenger service, but they often stuck a coach onto the end of the stone trains. And this was maddening for me, trying to figure out where those coaches were going and when, and I never was able to nail it down. Um, but there are references in the local paper. They call one of the trains the Red Onion because of the uh, immigrant workers that rode the coach. Um, but I can't give you the history of all the different stone spurs because there are quite a lot of them. But there is a man in the room who can. <laughs> Clay Stuckey, who's uh, done a couple talks on it. So that's a guy you want to talk to. And I think you can even see his talks on YouTube. Yeah. Yep. Other questions? I know it doesn't relate to Bloomington, but do you have a picture of the not in my personal collection. I know that there, I've heard that there are pictures out there. But, okay, well that's, I'll put that on my list. You know, I've got a list of like magic photos I've always wanted to find, so I'll add that to it to see if I, I could find it. Yes. Dest destroyed in a train wreck and train carrying matches, I believe. He had another train. It's not a good wreck. Other, other questions? Thanks to John for a great program. Thank you for all your time.